Yeah. Okay, good morning. It's, what is today? I don't even know what today is anymore. Friday? Friday the today is Friday, October 5th, the third day of Chalamod. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, I, uh, I got up at, I don't know, somewhere like 4 o'clock in the morning today. Me too. I was very tired, and I have a, have a busy day today. But I noticed I did some painting. We did some painting in my apartment, and the entire painting, the wall, the, uh, the paint was peeling oh. off the wall. And I was very upset, so I uh, scraped the entire wall, and I plastered it. Then I came to Shul over here. This morning. This, yeah, this morning. Then I came to Shul this morning here. I had to take care of some things. Then I went to the mikveh. Then I went to Daven in, in Young Israel, <laughs> because I have things to do today, and I rushed to Davening there so that I can be here on time. So, uh, <laughs> 10 minutes late. And I am exactly uh, two minutes early. <laughs> and uh, we will get Benny a new watch, so he'll be able to distinguish Mandy, between... Mandy, you have to, Good the way. same way you lost your weight, you have to take out some of the knowledge from your system, yeah. so you, then you're going to feel better too. Okay, what was your car doing here all night? Because I, I, sl- I, you know, I slept early, then I woke up at 4.30. I was in Borgada, my wife, she's there. So you were here at 5, five like 5, 5.30, yeah? yeah? yeah. Where I, were you? In the shul? In the car. No, but are you in the car? Took oh, a nap. I was here, I came to shul. Then I, then I, I didn't know what to do in a hotel room. She's sleeping, the, yeah. the, 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 you know, I said, you know, okay. let me go. <laughs> um, I didn't mean to... to uh, to get on your case about being incorrect and saying that I was late. But uh, I was actually, I had this, this thought today, listening to all these things about the, about, the, uh, about the debates and everything, and it's amazing how people are clinging to every single word that, that, a, that a potential uh, uh, president may make. And... Uh, Sometimes, yeah, sometimes one word makes the difference. And we should really be careful the way we say it. You know, it says, uh, we learn in, in, in Perikovas, this is not what I was going to talk about today, but, you know, we learn in Perikovas um, that Hashem created the world in, in ten sayings. I think it's the, uh, I don't know. I don't know the the Basara Mamoras Nivrolam. With ten utterances, Hashem created the world. Okay. So the question that's right away asked is, why did Hashem need ten? He could have done it in one. So, so the answer that's given right there on the spot is, and so to reward the people who do good in this world, that they get more of a reward because Hashem took the time to do it in ten utterances. So the, you know, Hashem put in, so, so to speak, more effort, and you're doing good, so you get more of reward. And uh, conversely, that for those that do bad, they will get punished more because they wasted uh, a, a world which was created in ten sayings. So the question that I always ask is, what's the big deal? So Hashem used ten words. What is it? What, instead of one. I mean, big deal. Well, what, what, why does anybody have a problem? Why does anybody... First of all, for Hashem, time doesn't mean anything. So it's not like it took more time. It's not like it took more effort. <laughs> it's not like it took Hashem any greater uh, energy maybe to had, do maybe it. Maybe he had to wake up early for that. <laughs> so why are we so bothered with the fact that, it, that Hashem did it in ten instead of one? So the answer, I think, is, is clearly that it teaches us a lesson in life. And the Gemara talks about this a lot that if you can get something accomplished in one word, then do it in one word. Don't do it in ten. And basically, as I always say, siyag l'chach the, 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 uh, one of the methods to, to, to protect your wisdom is basically to be quiet sometimes. Sometimes just be quiet and listen and, uh, and don't say anything extra. The Gemara... The Gemara says, La'olam yedaber odem baloshen kutsara. And uh, it talks about, that we see sometimes in the Torah, that something is said in a very short phrase as opposed to saying it in a long phrase. And the Gemara says that a person should always speak 
in a shortened fashion. So that's why the Gomorrah has a problem when the Torah talks about animals which are not, which, which are not kosher, it says, and those animals which are not clean. Why does he, the Gomorrah has a problem with that? Hey, I thought you're supposed to say in a short version. Why don't you say unclean animals? Why do you use extra words, and those animals that are not clean? So there the Gomorrah says, this is an exception, that the Torah is refraining from saying something which is not nice. So you don't want to use the word unclean, an animal that's unclean. Tomei, a tomei, tomei is a, is a, is a, a uh, negative word, so rather say not clean than say tomei. Rather, when you say somebody is a liar, say he's not telling the truth. Okay? Rather than saying somebody is fat, say he's not thin. I just threw that in because I know Benny will enjoy that. Um, so, so first of all, I want to apologize. No, I didn't mean to, to jump on you when you, when you said, when you said I was late. Uh, you know, I, uh, one of the things I used to do is not necessarily marriage counseling, but I used to mediate uh, people who had troubled marriages. You know, the shoemaker who goes with torn shoes. Look at me. I'm a guy who divorced several times, and I'm mediating other people's uh, you know, marriages uh, or whatever, marital issues. But I've been very successful, and, and I, I'm batting a thousand. Every, every couple that I've mediated, even the ones that were already separated, and in, in some cases already by lawyers and forensic accountants and everything, I've gotten them to, you know, to, uh, to reconcile their marriages. Why do you do that? Why, you do, why don't you let them be happy? <laughs> <laughs> because I used to do this. I'll tell you, it's a very good question. Benny is asking, why do, I, why do I prolong their agony? The answer is that I was going through a very nasty divorce. And as a distraction from my own divorce, I, would, I, I felt bad for people who were going through a divorce, and I was trying to help out other people. And as a result of that, I was able to get them back together. Um, here's a situation that, that may or may not have happened, and I'm saying it for a specific reason, is that you really have to, number one, let me just backtrack for a second. When we say al chayt, when we go like this on Yom Kippur, there are how many? Anybody know? I think there are, I don't remember now, 48, 49, or 50? 48. 48. Then he says 48. Now, you would think that there's some major sins that we should go like this, al you, you would think that it would be the ones that we sort of physically did, uh, maybe in the sexual arena. You know, you, that you were not following the laws the way it should be, that you did, you know, you had illegal, uh, immoral uh, relations. You would think maybe that the majority of them would be either that or majority would be maybe physical harm to somebody else. Surprisingly enough, I did this on Yom Kippur, 20 out of these, I think it's 20, but certainly the vast majority of these had to do with the mouth. And after, after davening today, you can go through it. That we are, we are uh, repenting for the sins that we did with our mouth, whether it's uh, lying, whether it's making fun of somebody, whether it's saying lush and horror. It, you'll go through it. it. They have to do with the mouth, because the mouth is the most dangerous organ. And uh, you, should, you should really be careful what you say. Say what you mean and mean what you say. And... Uh, that's why you have two fences for it. Right, exactly. Benny is saying that, f that to protect it, we have the teeth and we have the lips. And sometimes you have to grit your teeth and not say anything. And I've been working on that, and sometimes people don't like it, but if I feel myself out of frustration, exasperation, or whatever, that you know, I'm going to lash out or something, I'm just quiet. And I, I work on that in my office, uh, with my employees, and with my children, and anywhere else in my, in my life. I try not to... I had a situation here in shul where somebody cheated me out of a lot of money, one of, one of the people that have over here. And I'm so tempted 
to like really lash out and embarrass him and do something about it. But I, I've been holding back. It's been uh, like eight or nine months already, and he comes into the shul, and he, everybody loves him and adores him. But he cheated me out of, of uh, quite a few thousand dollars. I'll give you the five dollars. Give, give it to me slowly, <laughs> uh, Pat. You don't have to pay Ten it all payments. at once. What? Ten payments. Ten payments. Uh, so here's a situation that may have happened with a certain couple. This, this particular wife was an expert in braiding challah. Okay, and you ever notice though sometimes when you cut open the challah on Shabbos, it's sort of the braids didn't take and they unfold. And this happens a lot, that they didn't bake into each other. So this woman was asking her husband, um, how long do you think it takes me to braid these challahs? So the husband, wanting to make his wife feel good, says, knowing that she's very qualified to do it, and she says, you know what, when I braid my challahs, they never come apart. How long do you think it takes me to do it? So the husband replies, about five seconds, meaning to compliment her, that you know, she doesn't have to spend the whole day braiding, that she can do it quickly. Later on, the wife complains, uh, you know, my husband is so unappreciative of what I do, he thinks it takes me five seconds to bake challahs. So here's, here's the problem. First of all, not only, she didn't, she, didn't, she didn't remember her own question. Her question was, how long do you think it takes me to braid? She didn't ask how long it takes me to make challahs. So she didn't remember her own question. The husband heard the question, how long it takes to braid, so he goes five seconds, and he meant to compliment her. She gets insulted, and the question is, the, and, and things from there just, just went out of proportion. I'm, I'm saying something like this may, may have happened at one, the, at one of the marriages that I was involved in. And, uh, and uh, people are so, when they're going through difficult times, they don't even remember what they said two seconds later. And as a result of that, they, they can cause all kinds of, of issues. Um, so... Uh, we are now in the yunt of, of, of sukkahs. We're, we're approaching uh, the last days. The Shana Rab, as I said yesterday, is the final day of sukkahs. Now, Benny asked yesterday a question, why are we permitted to work on, this, on the last day of sukkahs? Uh, we know that from Pesach, the first days is especially holy in the last day, so how come over here we're not? So the answer clearly is, as, as we know, that in the Torah, it does not say it's that on the seventh day, you shouldn't do any work. It only says the first day. And, but we have another problem. The problem is that all the laws that apply to Pesach apply to Sukkot because we have a concept that's called Gezer Shava. That's on the 15th of the month. This is on the 15th of the month. And we make a million comparisons. So why don't we make a comparison here that the last day of, of Sukkot should also be a Yontav and you shouldn't do any work? So the obvious answer is because the Torah goes and says right away after Sukkot, Ubayoma Shmini Atzeres Yelachem. So this coming Monday, Shmini Atzeres. So that's the eighth day of what? Here's the question. It's the eighth. We have a we have a yontif called Shmini Atzeres. Are you all familiar with that? What does Shmini Atzeres mean? The eighth day. Eighth stopping. day of what? A stopping. The, the, yeah, but Atzeres also means yontif. Okay, so what is it? It's Yom Hashmini, Atzeres Yelachem. A yontav should be to you. The root word of Atzeres means stopping, but it, literally it means yontav. So it's the eighth day of what? Sukkot. It's so problematic. There's nothing which is more of a problem in our religion. Nothing as this holiday. Is it Sukkot or is it a yontav by itself? Do we eat in the Sukkot or do we don't we eat in the Sukkot? We just don't know what to do with this. The Israelis, they don't sit in the sukkah? It has nothing to do with Israel or America. The eighth day of... We of sit in the well, sukkah. Well, the Hasidims feel that it's like a day above... Like it's like the eighth is always above nature. The, right. The, you know, but it's, but the, the fact that we're calling it the eighth day means that it's a continuation of the first seven, so it is sukkahs. But then again, we know that it's a holiday by itself, Yom Tov Bifnei So... The universal, 
practical universal acceptance is Yasminen Mesivin Vibrachinen Lo Brachinen means that we do sit, but we don't make a brach. So nobody makes a brach Asher Kachurim Litzun Elisha Basoka. But certain people on, 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 Monday. On, Monday. Monday. on Monday. On Monday. Sunday is the seventh day, and we do make. So some people sit, some people will go, will sit only fry on, on Sunday night, and, sh- and Monday morning they'll go in and just make Kiddush. Some people don't even do that. So it's in Israel, they, they sit in the Sukkah, and, but it's a Sivchat Torah. They are only one day. Right. They don't right. have two days. They don't have two days, no. no. So they sit in the Sukkah and also... They don't sit in the Sukkah. The eight day, you don't so sit. Them, eight day is... I know, we sit. No, no, it has nothing to do with Israel America. Shmini Atzeres, the eight day, is a, in limbo. Is it Sukkot or is it not Sukkot? That's, that's the well, issue. Simchas Torah, that's a whole different home. Simchas Torah different. is just that's a... Simchas Torah is, is the same as Shmini Atzeres. Okay. In America, we hold two days Shmini Atzeres. We call the second I day see. Simchas Torah. Okay, but it's this... Oh, I it's the know. same thing. Okay. Okay, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, it. it's, like, it's like in America, all the holidays have two days, because in Israel, all the holidays are only one day, yeah, except Rosh Hashanah. So yeah, we just call it a, 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 okay. a second day. Now, I just want to, for a minute, talk about the Ishpizen. Is everybody familiar with that word, Ishpizen? What does it mean? Guess. The guest. So every day we have a different guest. What's today's guest? Who's today's guest? Uh, um, Besides Abraham, Marvin. Besides Marvin. Moshe, I don't know. What, who's yeah, today's Aaron. guest? Uh, who's today's guest? Yes, right. So. Aaron. Aaron. So today's guest is Aaron Akoin. Um, so. Well, he's the peacemaker, so that's. So he's the peacemaker. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm going to get to that. Oh, sorry. No, not, not sorry at all. Um, glad you're paying attention. <laughs> uh, the, now, what does that mean? That Aaron is coming to our sukkah. He's visiting us. Every day, somebody else, Avram, Yosef, Yankov, Moshe, Aaron, Yosef, and David. Some people put Yosef before. But nevertheless, so the question that I saw recently is, where are these people now? Avram, where are, they, where are the patriarchs and, and Aaron? And, you know, they're in Gan Eden. They are leaving Gan Eden to come to us? Why would they do that? That doesn't even make sense, that they would leave Gan Eden to come to us. The answer is, they are not coming to us, we're coming to them. And the sukkah is really the connection between, as I said yesterday, that we, we, we step out of our physical world, so our comfort, our house, and we go into, into the shadow of God, into God's presence, and which is sort of the connection, the... the uh, the, the bridge between earth and, and the sky or between, between this world and the next world and we are, we are coming to them. It's and almost like Jacob's letter. Exactly. Like exactly like Jacob's letter. Now, I don't want to change the subject but uh, regarding Mechiat Ametim, yes. people are, let's say, we, are, we believe somebody is good, they're going to go to Gan Eden. Right. So what's the what's Mechiat Ametim? That he's, he's going to come back from the Gan Eden and come to the earth again? Okay, so what Mechiat Ametim, the resurrection is unclear exactly what it is. Um, uh, we, don't know, we, don't know, we don't know if the resurrection is going to be in a physical sense or in a spiritual sense. So I'm not, certainly not qualified to, to talk about this. Uh, yeah, so you brought something that you're coming yeah. back and you wanted to... But it's right. with, with this... The hmm? Isn't it more like um, like the energy of that person, like the, like the the thing that they stand for, like you know, with like love and kindness, or like it's like right. the attribute. Isn't that what more permeates the day than actually like it's not like a person coming down, or it's not like well, physical. obviously it's, it's not the, the person. Obvi- obviously it's not the person, but right. you're right. It's the energy, but more so it's the merits of that of that person that's that's going that we're going to be mixing with them. We are mixing ourselves. We are becoming one with the merits. See, here's what happens. On Rosh Hashanah, we go to shul and we, we ask for forgiveness. Okay? And, on, and if God forbid we didn't, uh, we didn't uh, 
accomplished that on Rosh Hashanah, we get a second chance. We go to the appeals, the appellate division. Yom Kippur is the appellate division. We go and appeal and we ask God for, for you know, to rescind anything that we have done and anything that he may have already written into, into, into the red column. We ask him to move it over to the black column, you know, and uh, we have that whole day and then comes Nila and when it, we, we, we make our final plea, we go to the Supreme Court of, in Washington, so to speak, and we go to the ultimate court, but, and we're all confident that, that our sins are forgiven, okay? But it doesn't end there. Here's the problem. Nothing that happens in this world disintegrates. As, as it's brought down in many places, Every, every utterance that was, every sound that anybody made is still going on because it keeps vibrating, reverberating, so it's, it keeps going on. Every action, it doesn't stop. If I, if I move these keys, this action is continuing. It's causing ripples effects in the atmosphere and this. Everything can, can, nothing disappears. If I lose weight, it didn't go into thin air. What happened to that weight? Somebody else got it. Somebody else got it. <laughs> Should I turn the camera? No, Benny, you're doing good. But uh, the world is exactly balanced. Nothing happens. If, if there if the, was one molecule of oxygen or nitrogen more in the world than it has to be, the world would be destroyed. The world is a perfect balance. And um, I heard, I'm sorry to interrupt you, I heard if you go uh, faster than the uh, light, the, right. and you go to a different star, yeah. You could see that action. Exactly. Exactly. We, know, we, we, we all watch Superman movies. I read Superman comics that if you go fast and speed of light, you go, you go backwards. That's not, a, that's not sci-fi. That is in real. That's in real world. Um, so you could go even faster. You could right. see the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, how he did. Right. Exactly. <laughs> the whole thing. Exactly. Because every action still continues to go. Everything still continues to go. So if that's the case... What happens to our sins? Our sins are still there. So let's say God forgives us for the sin. But the sin is still there. Forgive, but don't forget. I thought they were washed away completely. So how, but where does it go? I don't know. Okay. So here's the beautiful answer that I heard, and that has to do with the Shpizen. That uh, we have a concept of bitul. Bitul means that if you have a, a, um, a pot of, of soup, or a pot of meat, okay, and accidentally the opposite drops in. Uh, an ounce, of, an ounce of, of milk went into a vat of, of uh, chicken soup. Are you allowed to eat it? Yeah, 160th. Okay, so if it's more than 160th, it's called, it gets nullified. Now it's still there. The milk is still there. But yet we're allowed to eat it. Why is that? So there is actually a, um, a debate among the rabbis whether the, uh, the concept of bitul means that it makes it kosher or that it makes it, it's still, it's still milk, it didn't, it's still milk, but because it, there's so much more right. of the other stuff in there, so therefore is it, it becomes allowed. You're, whether so, the concept of of bittel, is it that we allow it or that we actually converted it? So we believe that, especially when it comes to sins, and if we and if we we know that if we do if we do tshuva, then all the sins that we have committed on purpose gets downgraded when you do tshuva. It becomes, as, it becomes as if you did it by error. And all the sins that we committed by error, if you do tshuva, if you repent, what happens to those sins, the ones that we by error? Mitzvah. They become mitzvahs. So, so this is what we're doing on sukkahs. We're inviting these great tzaddikim, Avram, Yisrael, and Yaakov, to our sukkah. All their merits will now be certainly so much more than our sins that they nullify our sins. That's beautiful. And we are now, now we are in 
in, uh, in a pristine setting where there is no more sins, just like in Aden, because, because we, have, we have encircled ourselves and we have, we have anytime you're ready, I dabbed already. But I, I still, what? I still I didn't get the answer for the which one is right now. Uh, uh, Batel Bero. It's, um, it's, it's it's five get, three. Whenever you're ready, it's nothing to do with me. Anybody want to go do brachas? I wanted to speak also about something. We'll, maybe we'll have to I do it after Yom uh, The concept that we take a beautiful lesser. You know, Shlomo Melech said, "Have a uh, That beauty is mundane. So how come in an Esri we want something beautiful? What's the concept of beautiful in the Jewish, in our Torah? Is there such a thing as beautiful? Should we value beauty? And it's a very interesting discussion. If you remind me next week, I'll do it. Everybody have a good Shabbos and good Yom.